Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live. Multiple stations today. We got Instagram live. We're over live on YouTube and two Facebook pages. So um, getting multiple uh, sites done all at once. Taking questions, giving some answers, <clears throat> as well as showing some combat swimmer stroke uh, critiques. I think I have three of them lined up for you. If you're over on Instagram, um, when I'm showing the critiques, you may want to jump over to YouTube because um, you won't be able to see them because they're linked in my StreamYard um, video process there. So you can hear me talk about it, but I uh, probably won't be able to see it. So anyway, <clears throat> happy Tuesday. We are now uh, getting after it, hitting a pretty good workout this week. Um, yesterday was a good upper body day. Today was a moderate leg day with some hills. Um, unfortunately, our spring training has turned into winter again because it is like 20 something. Kind of sucked out there today, won't lie. Um, but as... Uh, should be turning the corner here in a little bit. <clears throat> like I said, taking questions. If you guys want to send some questions over on Instagram, send them. Also, I see questions popping up already. People saying hi um, from Europe. That's cool. Thanks for listening over there. Um, workouts with sleds. Is it good for cardio? Yeah, I think it's good. Very challenging. Great on the legs and the lungs. <clears throat> In fact, um, we're talking today. We had a, a Green Beret join us, uh, working out with us, and he he recommended the guys put on a backpack and tie a sled to it because it really helps you work your posture and hips, um, getting under the weight and being able to pull the weight. Um, so if you're putting on, trying to prepare for rucking, he said that was a really good way to add to your leg day like that. Um, so we'll give it a try. In fact, we have a weight vest that we tie to our sled. We have a little D-ring on the back of the weight vest. Um, works really well for pulling sleds with a little extra weight. And he's right. That really gets the hips, hip flexors, as well as the uh, uh, just forces you almost have a perfect posture when you do it. Let's see. All right. So we got some uh, questions, but before we get into some answers, um, I wrote an article this week over on stewsmithfitness.com called The Case for Calisthenics and Cardio This Spring. In fact, it's uh, it's pretty good. You should check it out. There's everything from just getting outside and doing things with no equipment, getting some vitamin D, which is very much needed. Um, there's some good links in there to the importance of vitamin D. Um, also, <clears throat> you know, after a bulk season or a winter lift cycle, time to rip it up a little bit, lean out a little and, um, you know, wear less clothes and enjoy it get some sun. Uh, you can mix in some other stuff though, to make calisthenics harder, weight vests, callus, uh, TRXs, um, sandbags, you know, all of those are really effective ways to, you know, work some auxiliary muscles. Maybe that the calisthenics by themselves don't mix. Um, plus it just gets you in better shape you know, better work capacity. You may even find that because you're adding in a cycle of calisthenics and cardio, when you go back to lifting, you're going to have a quicker recovery from that, um, from doing that cycle versus skipping all work and high rep and cardio events all together and just lifting. Um, but yeah, it also depends. You know, if you're a strength athlete, you definitely need it. If you're an endurance athlete, you may not need as much cardio as everybody else, but you're definitely going to need some strength stuff. And a good way to build strength, if you're coming from that background, is uh, get a calisthenics base and then go into weights <clears throat> later on, you know, in the cycle. 
So, but you guys check it out. It's pretty good. It's got some cool pictures in here. Um, good links in here as well. It's called The Case for Calisthenics and Cardio Cycle this spring. It's over at stewsmithfitness.com. All right. So let's take some pictures uh, or some questions. Um, over here on YouTube, we got as a big guy who is almost 300 pounds, damn, who can swim freestyle. Awesome. Would it be smart to start swimming the combat swimmer stroke to lose weight or continue swimming in freestyle? <sighs> um, either one. I like both. I mean, I probably swim half and half whenever I'm doing workouts. I like to swim freestyle for upper body days uh, and days that I'm not wearing fins. But on days that I'm wearing fins, I like to do the CSS. Uh, we usually do fins on leg days. So, um, you know, I like to do the CSS and turtle backing a little bit. So go really hard for like 75, you know, so three links and then do an easy 25 turtle back where you're just laying on your back flutter kicking. It's a good way to work the legs. You can catch your breath and hit that next set of 75 really hard without really resting. Your rest is that 25 yard turtle back. And uh, that's just a good way to just, you know, hit it, you know, for constant movement of the legs. So that's where I would be, you know, get some distance in there, get some time in there. You know, at 300 pounds, doing a non-impact cardio is very wise, I think. Um, if you can get away from running, um, your knees and hips will probably definitely thank you for not um beating them up so much, you know, bike, elliptical, row, swimming, all, all you is what I would do. If you have little aches on your shins and ankles, should you run through the pain or should you take a break? Ah, uh, um, I would be smart and, you know, not run through the pain. I mean, there's going to be a time maybe in your training that you can't, you don't have that choice and you have to suck it up. Um, <clears throat> but if you're just training on your own to try to improve and try to progress with your running, you probably need to take a break and maybe run every other day, do some non-impact cardio on the days in between, make sure you're stretching, uh, rolling out, massaging all those achy joints and um, or achy ankles and uh, shins. So um, you can recover for the next day and try to run again, but don't progress too quickly. You know, a lot of people jump right into like a 20 mile run week. And next thing you know, they're injured, you know, so you got to progress real logically, treat yourself like a beginner when you have an injury and just, you know, five to 10 miles a week max, and then 10% increase each week. Otherwise you're going to get yourself you know, injured again, and then, then you can't run again. So, but whatever I would do is I would do a daily source of cardio just to keep your cardio up, but make that cardio on the days in between uh, non-impact cardio. So I see a lot of stuff going over here on Instagram. Let me start off from the top. You guys uh, been blowing me up over here. Um, let me see if I have any questions. Already answered one about the sleds. Yes, love them. Absolutely. How do I start from the beginning after injury several years away from, from working out? <clears throat> Great question. I've answered this one many times. In fact, um, if you Google treat yourself like a beginner, Stu Smith, you have to treat yourself like a beginner. I have some beginner programming out there. Um, walk, don't run. Um you know, I have this uh, other workout called the Systems Check. You should check that one out. Um, it's just a way to get back into the gym and not hurt yourself. In fact, the title of the article is called Perform a Systems Check After Long Bouts with Illness, Injury, or Not Training. You got to check out that article. In fact, I'm going to put it in. I know you posted over here on Instagram, but I'm going to put it into the uh, comment section over on YouTube and Facebook. 
and you can just pull it right right up. But if you just do a Google search, perform a systems check after illness or injury, Stu Smith, you'll find it for sure. I ran too much too soon and ended up with Achilles tendonitis. That will happen. You'll either get Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, shin splints, IT band, or patella tendonitis. Those are all very common running injuries. That will happen if you start up too soon, too fast, and don't treat yourself like a beginner. You might be have you might have great cardio base from swimming or biking or doing something else, and you just kind of suck at running. And if you go into running with the same level of thinking of like, oh, I can run, I can swim for an hour, I can go run for an hour. Well, guess what? You're probably going to wind up getting hurt. And then, you know, if you're a bigger guy, that's even worse. You know, you're 200 plus, 220, you know, and you're not used to running, your your joints are going to hate you. All right, let's go over here <clears throat> to what Francesca is asking. See, while doing combat swimmer stroke, I have the impression that I'm really slowed down right before the scissor kick. Does it mean I'm doing something wrong? Yeah, you don't want to lose momentum in this stroke. You know, that's one of the problems. Typically, if you're slowing down before the kick, that means the cycle of pull, breathe, kick, glide. You are probably popping up to breathe. So you go from moving horizontal to vertical to inhale. And this is just a guess because I'm not seeing. In fact, in a minute, I'll share a CSS critique and show you. Um, but if you pop up to breathe, you quit moving forward and go vertical. It's like you almost just put on the brakes of going horizontal and you pop up to breathe. You lose all your forward momentum. So check that first. You should be turning to breathe. Right, turn to breathe like you are a screwdriver, not popping up to breathe. Because as soon as you pop up to breathe, next thing you know, your feet are down. Now your body position, you're just kind of pushing water versus trying to spear through the water and be more streamlined. Um, good question, though. Hip stability, question mark. What about it? Yes, you need it. How do you get it? I get it through my mobility days. Um, I also get it through every workout I do. I usually end with swimming. And every swim workout I do, I end with some form of treading or aqua jogging, legs only. So that's multiple movements of the hips. And then I end that with a quick five-minute dynamic stretch in chest-deep water. Absolutely. Uh, change my life with hip stability, hip mobility. Um, just that resistance movement in water and opening up the hips multiple directions because the hips and shoulders are very versatile. I mean, you can go in multiple planes of movement and you need to do that, you know, in water and you can find some really good stability. Now, you can also do this in the weight room with bands. I personally like to do it in the pool with a pair of fins on. Uh, multiple kicks, dolphin kicks, scissor kicks, flutter kicks, then without fins, breaststroke kicks, egg beater kicks. All of those are great ways to work the hips. And then, of course, you know, you can lay down on your back and do flutter kicks and leg levers and <clears throat> hip rotations and hip raises. Um, so there's a, so many things you can do for the hips. And I highly recommend it because most of us get tight hips and then it screws up a lot of stuff. I've seen tight hips screw up running, tight hips screw up lifting, tight hips screw up swimming and treading water. Um, so it pays to have mobile and stable hips. All right. Jake asks, um, my qualifying scores, swim, 823, 90 push, 90 sit, 19, run 930. What do you suggest I focus on now to get through not just two what do you think jake what do you think you should focus on if you're talking about buds you know what you got to do you got four mile timed runs every week you got two mile swims every week with a big pair of scuba fins on you have 
logs and boats for the first four weeks. And let me tell you, the first four weeks of any buds class is, is just a butt kicker. You're going to have a class that maybe starts with 150 and drop down to quite possibly single digits by week four. For instance, this last buds class, and it was a cold one. It was a cold winter class, so I get it. It's pretty challenging. They started with 130 on day one of first phase. They finished just this last weekend with nine in their class. Somebody told me 10. Wasn't sure if that guy got rolled back or not, but or rolled forward. But they finished with nine that got through. Nine or 10 that got through. So you do the math on that. Look at the attrition rate on that. You have to be durable enough to handle those first four weeks. That is how you get through buds. Because to be honest with you, after Hell Week, buds turns into, you know, triathlon training mixed with some calisthenics and some tactical training. You know, you're going to learn to dive. You're going to learn to shoot. You're going to learn land nav. You're going to be mission planning, you know, con uh, explosives. But you're also going to be running and rucking and swimming, doing obstacle courses and things like that. But there's no more boats and logs that beat you up. So it shifts a little bit, but you got to be durable those first four weeks. I bought a book from Lou Simmons on cardio. I have not seen that one. I have not considered interviewing Joe Hippensteel from Ultimate Human Performance. I would love to. Love to talk about uh, tactical fitness. Absolutely. Be a great podcast guest. Jeff and I are trying to get back on the schedule and do more weekly podcasts. Uh, he's been busy and I've been pretty crazy busy too. Uh, but we'll try to get our schedules to work better. From South Africa, what is a decent amount of pull-ups for a man of 60? Good question. You know what? I got a couple of 60-year-olds on my online training program, and um, they have gone from a couple pull-ups to double digits. Um, even had one hit uh, 20 last month, <clears throat> which was pretty good couple 55 year olds hitting 20 plus as well but i would say if you can get your pull-ups to 10 that is a really good pull-up number for anybody especially a 60 year old person but yeah you would be way above average on the human level and you will be a way above average on the 50 plus level of humans that can do pull-ups if you do that. So I'd say shoot for 10. Great question. Another one from uh, Instagram, and then we'll go to a quick uh, CSS video. Going to see a therapist soon, but have you ever dealt with the injury right above the elbow inner tricep muscle where it attaches? So right above the elbow <clears throat> where it attaches. I mean, if you're dealing with above the elbow you're and behind, you're probably dealing with some kind of tricep tendon back there. You know, um, haven't really dealt with that one personally. I've dealt with ones underneath the elbow, which is more of a forearm uh, tendonitis, like a tennis elbow type thing or a golfer's elbow. Um, sometimes you may have to lay off the push exercises a little bit to give your elbow some rest, <clears throat> tricep some rest. All right, so real quick, I'm going to make just a quick transition over to um, show a, uh, a CSS video. Let me uh, share my screen here. Let me know you guys can see that. Sorry, you guys over at uh, Instagram won't be able to see this, but I'm just going to critique this guy's swim for about a minute, and let's see what happens. So we got a kick off the wall. Now that dolphin kick right there, let me just show you something. When you bend your knees like that, <clears throat> that is not a dolphin kick. That is basically saying, hey, 
I'm going to bend my knees 90 degrees and completely stop all of my forward momentum with these uh, legs going vertical. Because that's pretty much what you're doing. You're you're basically going one step backward, one step forward when you bend like that. A dolphin kick actually comes from the hips and it it undulates down the legs. So it's not a bending of the legs like this. It is actually a wave that starts at the hips and whips down. So you got to learn how to do dolphin kick or my suggestion is just take it out because it's not helping you. So that dolphin kick can go. Don't do two of them. So don't do that either. So top arm, bottom arm kick. And then he does a dolphin kick with that top arm. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I think that's a waste of energy. Be honest with you. It's not really doing anything. Just wearing out your hips, thighs. And uh, when you bend your knees like that, once again, it's just, it's like swimming with the brakes on. Look at that. In fact, I'll just show you one more time. So you got the kick and then he got that right there. That's just, you, you need to be more streamlined with your kicks. It, it, like I said, it needs to be a whip kick from the knees down, not a bending of the knees 90 degrees and straighten them overall not bad you got a good top arm pull you need to be turning your head see what see when this top arm pull goes by your face should be starting to come out of the water as your arms going past you and then when it's past you you should be inhaling right now like your face is still underwater so that's a problem and it just throws off your timing. So what I do is I tell people, pretend you have a string tied to your nose from your hand. And when that thing goes past you, it's pulling your face out of the water when you're doing your top arm pull. So turn with the top arm pull, inhale with the bottom arm pull, because what you're having to do right now is you're having to turn your head, bottom arm pull, and inhale all at once. And it just is... It almost stops your momentum going. You see that? How you just kind of turn. One, you're looking up at the ceiling. Two, don't need to do that. Just turn 90 degrees. Half your face in the water like you're doing freestyle. All right. Well, that was fun. Let's go back over here to uh, Instagram real quick. Will you have a faster 1.5 mile time on a treadmill or a track? I've seen both. I don't prefer to do them on treadmills. However, sometimes when roads and tracks are ice, snow covered, or it's hot and humid and the air quality is like smoking a pack of cigarettes when you go out there, I'd recommend running inside and on a treadmill. But yes, you can get faster with treadmills. Once again, I don't like doing them, but I will when I need to. Um, let's see. Morning, sir. What's the ideal surface for running in spring summer program? Good question. Not many trails near me, mainly treadmills at the gym and soft turf outside. You know what? <clears throat> a couple things that we do. Uh, as I progress with running, we do have a paved trail where we run used to be an old railroad track now it's a paved trail however i try to run as much as i can on the side of it where there's a little bit of gravel and dirt versus running on the pavement that has helped a lot um if you can get a rubberized track that helps a lot if you can get on the inside of the track and run on the grass or the turf that helps a lot. Um, soft sand beaches are great. So one thing that we do is we run uh, on the beach every week. Um, do we just have this mile stretch of beach over on the uh, Chesapeake Bay? Run that on Fridays. Um, great softer impact run. Plus it gets you ready for soft sand running. Uh, ruck on there as well. We run, like today we ran the hill, which is about a six mile run of intervals and hill sprints and a mix of 
leg calisthenics and things like that. Um, but the hill is obviously pavement. It's a road. But what we try to do is try to hit some of the grass going to and from. And I would say out of six miles, I'm probably running on grass for four of it. So majority of my runs on a little bit softer turf. So that is how I do. Um, I try to find as much softer ground as I can when I'm running. Now, there'll probably be at the end of the week, it may come out to 50, 60 percent of my runs are softer ground than um, than harder ground. But it's a good, um, it's just a good way to um, make that uh, make that a little softer on your joints. Alex Griff, what's up? Good swimming. Keep swimming. Um, tips to building up to two mile swims with fins. Um, we swim with fins on leg days, so two times a week we will swim with fins, and progression is. A logical progression is swim a thousand, swim for a week, swim 1500 the next week, see if you can do 2000 the next week. But you may find the first four weeks of swimming with big scuba fins is very painful. So you may have to take those fins off and swim for five or 10 minutes without them, then put them back on, then swim without them and put them back on. And you'll find that after a month of swimming a couple times a week with fins, that your ankle mobility will get better and it won't hurt as much. So you have to really work your ankle mobility as much as you can. That's why you see some of my like mobility day poses. I'm really trying to work the ankles and I would highly recommend watching ballet dancers with their ankle mobility. And obviously you're not going to get anywhere close to their ankle mobility, but try some of their techniques that they use because that will help you tremendously with ankle mobility with scuba fins. All right. Are foot inserts allowed at Buds? Yes. The ones I used for our old boots that we had were um, Sorbathane. So S-O-R-B-A-T-H-A-N-E. Sorbethane insoles. I like those for my boots. They were really helpful. Um, got all different kinds. Find ones that work for you. But um, the Sorbethane insoles uh, were extremely helpful. I probably went through five or six of them because they get sand in there and it gets all crunched up. But you'll go through them probably a, a pair a month at Bud's with the wet and sandy boots. Advice for getting bigger and gaining weight. If you want to be big, you have to eat big and you have to lift big, um, period. Working out twice at the gym a day plus cardio in the morning. I'm not really gaining weight. Well, probably doing too much. I mean, it, it has also a lot to do with how much you're able to eat and how much you're able to pack on as a calorie surplus. So if you're burning a lot of calories running, doing a second lift, um, you know, you may be actually in a caloric deficit and losing weight at the end of the day. So you need to top every meal off with um, a milkshake, peanut butter and jelly, go to bed with a big glass of milk and a peanut butter banana sandwich. You have to pack on some food. Um, the cardio that you're doing, that's fine if you're trying to maintain your cardio, but be smart about it. Don't go for hour long runs after a lift because one, that just kind of screws up your lift. Two, it doesn't really do a whole lot for gaining weight as well. So you, if you want to get bigger, I, my suggestion is actually go through a strength and hypertrophy cycle. Um, reduce your cardio a little bit more and um, you, you got to work, you got to rest your muscles too. You know, two times a day can be done, but it has to be done smart 
and you can't do full body days every day. You know, you need to do a logical split routine of upper body days, lower body days, or maybe even a push day, pull day, leg day. You know, there's so many ways to do it. Um, you just need to find one that allows you to have a caloric surplus at the end of the week or end of the day. So at the end of the week, you might be able to gain a pound a week. That doesn't sound like much, but in 10 weeks, it's it's a lot. It's hard to gain much more than that. Uh, let's see over here on YouTube. Um, some of you guys are answering each other's questions, throwing me off there. Um, hey, Stu, how to deal with a tight right ankle after a run or after walking? Also very poor mobility while squatting around your ankle. Once again, uh, we talked a little bit about ankle mobility uh, with swimming with fins. Try swimming with fins. Actually helps quite a bit. Um, you will definitely loosen your ankles when you swim with fins. Now, I probably wouldn't recommend going into the big rocket fins or jet fins at first, but maybe, you know, just hit some slip on fins and see how that feels. Um, if you're not into swimming, I get it. Um, my suggestion is check out some ankle mobility exercises online. You can Google it on YouTube, actually, you know, search it on YouTube and um, you're going to see some people with some seriously hyper flexible ankles and if you can do just half of what they're doing to a degree um you're gonna be able to help yourself a lot so that's where i go wonder if i should do your workout plan for weights if my football team does weights in the morning monday through thursday no i would recommend you caden be a better team player than that and not burn yourself out listen to your coach and use those weights, you know, be a good team player, do what your coach is telling you. You know, last thing you want to do is burn yourself out with other workouts and then you suck at practice, don't have enough energy for the games, you're not as good as you could be, you get injured. You know, that's not really being a good team player. So, you know, yeah, you know, work on some weaknesses if you want. You know, a lot of times when you're in season, um, you know, work on some swimming after a practice, just kind of cool down and loosen up and, you know, maybe work on some technique stuff. But really your goal is to prepare for the next season and be strong and fast, durable. Um, you know, I'd, I'd play sports. You know, when you're playing sports, play sports, you know. <clears throat> and when, compete. Um, you have time to train for buds later or whatever you're training for later. Like I said, be a good team player. Trying to lose weight for running. Doing a lot of cows, swimming, running. Good. That's what I'm doing. Advice for eating enough to have energy, but not so much that weight loss is stagnant. You know, great question. You definitely need some carbs. You know, a lot of people will kind of go low carbs when they're trying to lose weight. For various reasons um my recommendation is definitely time your carbs prior to workouts so you have enough of that kind of energy whenever you go do your workouts um if you want to limit carbs later that's fine you, you still want some carbs after just to kind of replenish your glycogen stores and your carbs for the next workout that you do but you also need your proteins um and just the end of the day, just, you know, try to burn more calories than you're eating. Um, it's hard when you're trying to get really hard workouts in, uh, but you can do it. It's just, you got to write it down. You know how you write down your workouts and how you did? You need to also do a food diary and write down your um, food intake. Everything, every calorie you have in the day, write it down and what you're doing. And then you'll see leaks in your diet, um, you know, at the end of the week, you're like, oh, okay, this is why I'm not losing weight, or this is why I'm not gaining weight. You know, I need to add more calories or I need to do it. Otherwise you're just guessing, you know, if you're not assessing yourself 
like that every day. And it's a pain. I get it. Um, but what I do is I actually just keep a notebook like this or a uh, clipboard um, in my kitchen, long list. And if I put something in my mouth, boop, boop, gets written down. Um, another thing, too, if you're trying to lose weight, just the active thought of having to write it down is that little second of like, yeah, I really don't need this. You know, I don't need this handful of M&Ms. So it helps you with uh, discipline as well. <clears throat> Can you bring your own gear, boots, fins, and masks to pre-buds and buds? Um, if it is the same gear that they issue, so it's not, you know, a secret what they will issue you at buds. You're going to get Nike Combat Gen 2 boots, and you're going to get rocket fins or jet fins with booties. Um at buds you know if you have those to beforehand absolutely check them out get them um have them broken in you know use your own and whenever uh you know break in the other ones you know have a backup pair you know whatever you need to do but no, i i use my own when i was there i probably had three pairs of boots before i went to buds and then um had my own pair of fins, used those until they were broken. And then I turned them in and got a new pair. Um, so, yeah. There you go. So, hey, Sue, I was wondering, do your, oh, never mind. I already answered that question. What's your favorite meal at Bud's? Anything you enjoyed in the galley snacks you fond memories of? You know, good question. I really don't have any great memories of meals at Bud's. I just remember just wanting to eat. And it was more of a quality, had a quality all its own, if that makes any sense. I just pounded food because um, you needed that for the tank. Um, I did. I tell you what, I liked the galley that they had at the island. That was really good. I remember the food being really good there. You know, those big fat rolls they give you like in high school. They had those, always liked those rolls, and then chocolate milk. They had a chocolate milk machine that was just, had the best chocolate milk. So I guess I do have a few fond memories of things, but I can't really recall many details on proteins and carbs and things like that. One thing I would always do when I left the chow hall, though, is I would take peanut butter packets and honey packets, stuff them in my pocket. And later on in the day, you know, when you're going through, you got a break to go take a, you know, head call or you got a break in between events, you know, just putting in more calories in your, in your mouth before the next event. And that was something just to stay kind of topped up off, off the energy side. Uh, tell you what, let's do another, um, before I do another uh, video, there's a question. Did I catch Dr. Huberman's podcast with Andy Galpin? No, I did not. Um, I'm not familiar with that. You sent, send me a link um, in my DMs. I'll check it out. How do you want something bad enough that you work your hardest? I have no idea. It's a passion. It's something that resonates with your soul. Um, if it doesn't, then you probably don't want it hard enough. Um, is 12 weeks to bud similar to your calisthenics and cardio book? Uh, not really. It's a little bit different. 12 weeks to buds probably has a lot harder, higher repetitions in it than as far as volume is concerned. Calisthenics and cardio has a decent progression of volume. Um, it's got some newer workouts that I've created, you know, with the 50-50 workouts, um, mobility days in there. Um, 12 Weeks of Buds doesn't have any of that. Um, so it's it's kind of a 20-year evolution of how I write workouts now. Though the 12 Weeks of Buds is a butt kicker and it works. People like it, you know, uh, swear by it. But I will say that... Um, uh, my calisthenics cardio book has a beginner program, an intermediate program, and an advanced 
program similar to the 12 weeks to buds. Um, but I would say the 12 weeks to buds is harder, especially in volume of mileage, swimming mileage and uh, calisthenics volume. Um, no, I do not know when the SOAS list is coming out. Should be soon, though, because I have heard people are going. So people are starting to find out that they are going to SOAS. So let's uh, do another CSS uh, video here. Um, share my screen. See who this is. All right. So got a decent kick off the wall. Notice that no dolphin kick there. That's fine. You don't need it. All right. So a little bit of glary here. Can't really see exactly what he's doing, but I can see he's got a good rhythm. He's got a top arm, bottom arm, kick, hold the glide. Let's see how long. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. Now, I do see he could be a little more streamlined with his arms over his head. Like, I see kind of this position for the glide when you really need to be locked out, you know, and think of yourself like a torpedo versus, you know, flying like Superman like this. You need to be a little more streamlined. That makes a huge difference, believe it or not. Tuck your head down. Put your biceps on your ears and lock it out. This is really good. I would say just two things. Um, looking at him coming back, you know, one, the glide position, but two, probably kick a little harder, pull a little harder, and you'll go a little faster. So top arm, bottom arm. See how that top arm, like he doesn't really start getting vertical. Let me see if I can get it to show you here. Like he starts the stroke and he's finally vertical with his arm at his head where if you can reach out way in front of you and bend that elbow over your head and get this part of your forearm near vertical out in front of you and then you're pulling water like an oar, you're going to get a lot more out of your freestyle top arm pull. Because that's really just a freestyle arm pull, if you think about it. It goes all the way here, all the way down. The only difference is we don't recover it out of the water. We actually recover it up under the water like a breaststroke recovery. So my suggestion is watch videos on the freestyle catch. And um, <clears throat> try to put a little more effort into the kick and the arm pull. And that will make you go faster. Though I will say it's not horrible because you're hitting this at like 50 seconds, 52 seconds, which is fine. And it's pretty efficient. So not bad at all, actually. Um, like th those are kind of nitpicky critiques, if you ask me. Is there any goal I should be shooting for soft sand run boots for four miles? Um yeah, the good news is when you take four mile time runs at Buds, it's not in the soft sand. It's actually low tide, um, hard pack sand. Um, so it's it's not it's not soft. Uh, soft sand will slow you down a little bit. It's almost like taking your running, probably adding a minute per mile to it. You know, your good fast run on a track add a minute per mile to it is what I would say be shooting for, um, for sure. So try that. See if you could, if it only slows you down a minute per mile. Screener is this weekend, Naval Academy. Yes. So what happens at the Naval Academy is probably about a hundred people or more juniors will do what's called bud screening. And it is a weekend of BUDS level activities. You'll take a PST, you'll do logs and boats, and it's pretty much 36 hours of the worst parts of Hell Week all thrown into one 36 hour event. It, it, it sucks pretty good. And they got first phase instructors from BUDS out here doing it. So it is tough. It is very tough because the problem is 
is every class has probably about 150 people who think they want to go to BUDS when they graduate. Um, that number gets dwindled down to probably about 60 that actually go to SOAS. Um, and then that number gets dwindled down to about 30, maybe 35, if we're lucky, um, that actually go to BUDS whenever um, they graduate. So, yeah, that PST they take is very important. <clears throat> they take one PST and it counts. So you got to have your PST squared away. You can't just go take a dozen PSTs and finally pass it. You got to crush it on that one to even be close to competitive. And those competitive scores are legit. I mean, those competitive scores out of the academy, you know, are, you know, 100, 120 plus. Definitely. We'll have guys in the 30s on polls for sure. Um, you know, we'll have guys low sevens on the swim, low eights on the run. Um, so you got to put in some time to be a competitive candidate out of there for sure. That's not everybody. Now they, not all scores are like that. I would just say the highly competitive ones. I'd say like the top 10% are like those scores. You might have some, you know, eight minute swims nine minute runs, you know, 100, 120, you know, still in the ballpark with being competitive. All right. How much was I running before buds? Well, I was, once again, I'm going to say this. Uh, I came from a powerlifting background, football background. So I, it took me a couple of years to build up my running to where I needed to be, not only in distance, but also in pace. Um, and I played rugby, which helped with that, make that transition from football player to rugby player. Um, so I was probably getting anywhere between uh, 40 and 45 miles a week. Um, fast miles. Um, I was able to hit a four mile time to run. I think my fastest was like 2630, but my average was somewhere in the 28 minutes. Um, I think I had a bad run in third phase or in, yeah, third phase when I got injured and, um, I got rolled third phase, <clears throat> but that was my only failure on a run. Um, so, yeah, I think I was hitting, definitely hitting 35, sometimes 40. Just depends on, on the week. I, I don't think you need that much if, unless you are a, kind of a power athlete that needs to focus on running. And put it this way, I, I never once wish I'd lifted more weights when I was at Bud's. You know, I was strong enough going into logs and boats. I mean, I didn't like it, but. I wasn't crushed by it either. I just wished I'd run better. Um, running for me was the gut check. I never failed it, but it was a gut check. So I wouldn't fail it if that makes any sense. And I think everybody's like that. Everybody's going to have that little event in there that was once a weakness that you got to a good level. And now, you know, it's, you wouldn't really call it a strength, but it's not a weakness anymore, but it requires just a little extra focus and a little extra effort to keep it in standard. Like I'm saying like top 20% of the class, because that's where you want to be. Um, just my opinion on that. So. All right. A couple more questions. Do I have a podcast? Yes. If you look up, Tactical Fitness Report podcast, you will find it. I've done over 200 podcasts on that. In fact, if you go to my YouTube, they're all on YouTube, but you can also find them on my Apple Podcasts and all that stuff. How many pull-ups can Stu Smith do? I actually did 23 the other day. So um, just push, push myself on a max set once and got 23. <clears throat> can pull-ups, push-ups, back 
body weight squats be done daily if volume distribution is spaced out. I don't recommend doing anything like that it, unless it is just waking up and you're going to do 20 push-ups, 10 pull-ups, 20 squats just to wake up and get moving better. That's okay. Um, if you're doing anything with legit volume, you're going to need some recovery time. Um, Murph level volume needs recovery time. I've seen people doing, I don't know, months worth of Murphs or something. You know, that, that'd beat up on you a little bit. Some people can handle it. Most people cannot. Um, usually there's some tendonitis that's going to occur with that level of volume over and over and over again. So just kind of depends. So someone asked me, have I ever heard of Dorian Yates? Yes, big bodybuilder. If so, have you ever tried his way of training? No, I have not. One set to muscle failure per muscle group. No, not. I really have not done a whole lot of, I mean, I've done muscle failure, muscle fatigue training, obviously, but I haven't done it um, quite like that in that kind of bodybuilding system. Um, all right. So I got a few more minutes. Let me see here. How to prevent hips from sinking during glide phase of CSS. Um, initially it was my head popping up, but since I figured that out, they still sink towards the end of the glide. Um, my other focus would be for you would be focus on your kick and also a little core strength too. Like see if you can, you know, tighten yourself up a little bit because what I, what I've seen a lot of people do with their swimming posture is especially if they're on their side, right? They kind of look like a banana a little bit, right? Try to straighten yourself out and kick, get your kick set because your kick is going to produce power and your arm pull is going to produce power that gets you moving forward. The faster you get moving forward, you kind of plane out and get a little flatter, right? There's something going on with you losing momentum with your stroke that makes your body want to do this. You know, it's it, first of all, it could be a head that pops up. It could be a stroke and turn to breathe where you lose all your momentum whether it's popping up or it's a timing issue. Um, but typically, a body position change is a loss of momentum in the swim. My, my recommendation is send me a video and I can check it out for you. Um, let's see. A couple more questions. How would you recommend getting into... Distance for running, if in season for rugby. Uh, don't want to destroy my body while in season still. Yeah, I, I would be the same way. I mean, you can always add running to your rugby days. Um, I mean, I used to run a mile and a half to rugby practice and then run a mile and a half back to where I lived and you know did rugby practice and then on the way back i'd stop by the pool get a quick swim in just kind of cool down you know maybe 500 to a thousand yards um just get a cool down swim in practice some technique and then go on about my evening with food and studying and things like that um you can definitely add that kind of cardio to your rugby day so just treat it kind of like a warm up and a cool down to your rugby practice. You know, get yourself a mile, mile and a half in there before rugby practice. Um, that's not going to hurt you. Thomas, it's all right. I don't mind you telling me, you know, workout ideas. I get a lot of workout ideas from people. So. <clears throat> Let's see, last one, almost an hour here. So 
Did you work with Admiral Hulk Richards? Did you ever lift weights with him? No, never did. I, however, I was an ensign when he was a captain. So he was the CEO of Buds when I w went through Hell Week. Um, so that's how I knew him. I didn't know him. Um, didn't know him personally, other than being a student at his Bud's command when he was the commanding officer. Um, Pre-workout, post-workout. I actually have an uh, article called The ABDs of Nutrition. Um, and it reads like this. Uh, the after, before, during, right? ABDs of nutrition of workouts. Uh, check out that article. It's pretty cool. Um, I don't do pre-workout, I mean, other than some carbs. I don't do, like, the pre-workout caffeine powders. I just never like that. Um, I think, I don't think it's needed. But I definitely will eat and hydrate and do all those things before, during, and after. So check out that article. <clears throat> Thomas, that's quite all right. Um, let's see, I'm trying to see what I got over here on Instagram. What's my opinion of the physical training guide on the seal swick channel, not knocking anybody's fitness program. I don't do that. Um, I will say, I think it's a great place to start. It's a good beginner program. I don't think it has a level of fitness at the end that you need to get through buds personally, but it's a great place to start. So start there, build up, you know, you're probably going to need more mileage, probably going to need more reps. Um, maybe even some weight training too, depending on your athletic history. But, you know, here's the problem even, and this is for mine too. I mean, you know, I write workout programs all the time, right. And have dozens you know, that I, I sell. They're generic programs. You know, when you have a training guide, it's a generic program. You download something from the internet, you read an article in a magazine, whatever. It's a generic program. You have to personalize it for you to make it work for you. That means if you're an endurance athlete, <clears throat> you may not need to do all the running that a power athlete needs to do, right? Because you're already there. Right. You need to work on getting into the gym and being a little more durable so you don't break when you're under a load. The power athlete needs to like, holy crap, I need to be an aerobic animal, start PTing more and doing more running and swimming. A lot of that depends on your athletic history. <clears throat> Last thing, have I ever met or heard Don Shipley? I know Don Shipley very well. In fact, if you go to Don Shipley's YouTube page, you will find an interview I did with Don Shipley probably 10 years ago. Um, worked with him uh, a couple times. Really good guy. Funny as hell. He is one of the most entertaining people I, I know. Which book of yours is similar to the weekly email workouts? Good question. Because... Those weekly email workouts that I send out actually become books. Um, you know, I have a database of weekly workouts now for, I don't know, 20 years, maybe. Um, there's a lot of workouts. So I pull a lot of those from programs I know that worked really well for people. And I put them into a package, you know, this was what we did last spring and the spring before the spring training program. It was a three to one block periodization. Um, this is what we're doing now and what we did last year. This was my second time doing this one. I take that back. Um, calisthenics and cardio, same thing. It was just a section of our summer training cycle where it's simply all calisthenics and cardio. And I don't, know, I don't think I have a winter lift cycle book here, but if I did, that would be our winter lift cycle. So anything that is in the seasonal tactical fitness periodization section 
on my website at Stu Smith Fitness are actually spring, summer, fall, winter lift cycles or calisthenics and cardio cycles from the past. <clears throat> and they've just evolved over the years, I would say. Like I said, this is my latest one, one we're doing now. It's a three to one block periodization. So it's three weeks of calisthenics and cardio followed by one week of a running deload with some lifting in it. Still going to do some cows, but going to deload a little bit from that, kind of recover and then hit the uh, um, uh, hit the uh, calisthenics or hit the lifts a little bit for that one week, just for a maintenance for the lifting that we, you know, put on the, over the lift cycle and then um, come back into calisthenics and cardio the following week. So it's a three to one week. So <sighs> there you go. So are most SEALs Southern country boys who grew up with rifles in their hands? Uh, nope. I, you know, we had guys from the streets of Detroit and uh, cities um, all across America, farmers. Um, I just happened to be from the South, grew up in North Florida, swamplands of North Florida, hunting and fishing and, you know, doing that stuff on the Suwannee River all my life. Um, so kind of had a, a knack for camping and, you know, walking in the woods and stuff like that. So not that that drove me to be a SEAL or anything. It just happened to be my experience. You don't have to have that, you know, when you go. Like we had some very useful guys that had street smarts in the city. In fact, they could hotwire anything. And they gave us lessons on how to hotwire stuff. You know, so it was just everybody comes in with their, their own skill set. And then you try to learn it as best you can just to, you know, diversify your abilities and become a better team player. So, all right. I guess that's going to be it, man. Um. I got to go. I'm sorry if I missed your questions. Got a lot of questions here today. If I did miss your question, you can email me, stu at stusmith.com. Um, you can go on my Instagram. You can comment, you know, DM me. You can comment on uh, on this YouTube page or Facebook page um, where this live video is. Happy to do that. Um, Unfortunately, I do need to bail and uh, head out of here. So um, until next time, we'll make this uh, do this again on next Tuesday. I will chat with you later. Have a good one.